Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Rick here with theCUBE. We're having a CUBE conversation in the Palo Alto studio, a little bit of a break from the crazy conference season so we can have a, a little uh, more intimate conversation without the, the madness of some of the, uh, the shows. So we're really excited to have many time CUBE alumni, Guy Church Ward on. He's the president and CEO of Data Torrent. Guy, great to see you. Thank you, Jeff, appreciate it. So have you been surviving the, uh, the crazy conference season? Uh, it, it's, it's been crazy. This is very unusual. It's just calm and quiet and relaxed and there's not people buzzing around. So. Right. It's different. So you've been at Data Torrent for a while now, so give us a kind of the quick update, where you guys are, how things are, are moving along for you. Yeah, I mean, I've kicked in about five months, so I think I'm just coming up to sort of five and a half, six months. So it was enough time to get my feet wet, understand whether I made a massive mistake or whether it was exciting. Um, I'm you're pleased. still here, you're wearing the t-shirt. Yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to say I'm still very excited about it. Right. It's a great opportunity and the space is, is just hot, hot. So you guys are involved in, in, in streaming data and streaming analytics and you know, we had Hadoop was kind of the hot thing in big data and, and really the focus has shifted now to streaming analytics. You guys are playing right in that space and have been for a while, but you're starting to make some changes and come at the problem from a slightly different twist. Give us an update on what you guys are up to. Yeah, I mean, so, so when I dropped into Data Torrent, obviously it's um, you know, real-time data analytics you know, based on stream processing or event processing. So the idea is to say, instead of doing things like analytics, insight, and action on data at rest, right. you know, a traditional way of doing things is sucking data into a data store and then poking it you know, litigiously at a, at a, at a, a sort of a, a real-time analytics basis. And um, what the company decided to do, and again, this is around the founders, is to say, if you could take the insight and action piece and shift it left of the data store in memory and, and literally garner the insight and action when an event happens, then right. I, that's obviously faster and it's quicker. Right. And it was interesting, a client said to us recently that you know, batch or stream or near real time or micro batch is sort of like real time for a person because a person can't think that fast. Right. So the latency is a fact of that. But what we do is real time for a computer. So the idea is that you literally have sub second you know, latency and response and actions and insight. Um, but anyway, they built a toolkit and they built a, a development platform and it's a completely extensible and we've got a dozen customers on board and they're high production and people are running and you know, a billion events per second. So it's, it's very cool, but there wasn't this you know, repeatable business. And I think the deeper I got into it, you also look at it and you say, well, Hadoop isn't the easiest thing to deploy. Right, right. And so, you know, what, and, 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 and you know, the, the, the company had this mantra really of uh, going to um, uh, solve total cost of ownership and uh, time to value. So in other words, how fast can I get to an outcome and how cheap is it to run it? So can you create unique IP on top of open source right. that allows you to basically get up and running quickly. It's got a good budget constraint from a scale up perspective and scale out. Um, but at the same time, you don't need these genius developers to work on it because there's only a small portion of people who basically can deploy um, you know, a Hadoop cluster in a massive scale right. um, in a reliable way. So we thought, well, the thing to do is to really bring it into the masses. Um, but again, if you bring a toolkit down, you're really saying, here's a toolkit and an opportunity and then build the applications and see what you can do. Um, what we figured is actually what you want to do is to say, no, let's just see if we can take Hadoop out of the picture and the complexity of it and actually provide an end-to-end -end application. So we looked at each of the customer's current deployments and then figured out, you know, can we actually industrialize that pipeline? In other right. words, take the open source components, ruggedize them, scale them, make sure that they, they, they stay up, they're fault tolerant, 7 by 24 and then provide them as an application. So we're actually shifting our focus, I think from just the, you know, what I call the Apex platform and this stream-based processing platform to an uh, application factory and actually producing, you know, end-to-end -end applications. It's so interesting to think of, you know, batch and batch and not real-time compared to real-time streaming, right? We used to take action on a sample of old data. Yeah. And now you've got the opportunity to actually take action on all of the now data. Pretty significant difference. Yeah, I mean, it, it kills me. I mean, I've got to say, since the last time we met, I literally wrote a, I wrote a blog series, and one of them was called uh, Analytics, Real Time Analytics versus Real Time Analytics. And, and I had this hilarious situation where I was talking to a client, and, and I asked, and, and I said, Do you do real time analytics? They go, Yeah. And I said, Do you work on real time data? And they said, Yeah. And I said, What's your latency between an event happening and you being able to take an action on the event? And he said, Well, 60 milliseconds. I said, That's amazing. So I said, well, tell me what your architecture looks like. And he says, well, I take Kafka as a, into Apex as a stream. I then import it, in essence, into uh, Cassandra. And then I allow my customers to poke the data. So I said, well, 
but that's not 60 milliseconds. And he goes, no, no, it is. And I said, well, what are you measuring? He goes, well, the customer basically puts an inquiry onto the data store. And so literally what he's doing is a real-time query against a stale data that's sitting inside of a data lake. But he swore but blind. Fast, though, right? and, and that's the thing is he's looking and saying, hey, well, I can get a really quick response. Well, I can as well. You know what I mean? I can look at um, Google World and I can look at my house and I can find out that my house is not real time. You know, and that's really what it was. So you then say to yourself, well, look, the whole security market is based around this technology. It's classic ETL, and it's basically get the data, suck it in, park it into a data store, and then poke at it. Right. You know, but that means that that latency, by just the sheer fact that you're taking the data in and you're normalizing it and dropping it into a data store, your latency is already out there. And so one of the applications that we looked at is around fraud. You know, and uh, specifically payment fraud and credit card fraud. And, and everything out there in the market today is basically its detection. Because of the latency, if you kind of think about it, credit card swipe, the transactions happened, right. they right. catch the first one, they look at it and say, well, that's a bit weird. If another one of these ones comes up, then we know we've got fraud. Well, of course, what happens is they suck the data in, it sits inside a data store, they poke the data a little bit later and they figure right. out, actually, it is fraud. Right. But the second action has happened. So they detected fraud, but they couldn't prevent it. So everything out there is payment fraud prevention or payment fraud detection because it's basically got that latency. So what we've done is we said to ourselves, no, we actually can prevent it. Because if you can move the insight and actions to the left-hand side of the data store, and as the event is happening, you literally can grab that card swipe and say, no, 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 you don't do it anymore, you prevent it. So it's literally taking that whole market from, in essence, detection to prevention. And, and this is a, um, it, it's kind of fascinating because there's other angles to this, you know, um, the, there's a marketplace inside the credit card side that talks about um, uh, card not present. And there's a thing called omni-channel. And omni-channel is interesting because most retailers have gone out there and they've got their bricks and mortar infrastructure and architecture right. and data right. centers. And they've gone and acquired an online company. Right. And so now they have these two different architectures. And if you imagine if you've got a hop between the two, it kind of has gaps. And so the fraudsters will exploit omni-channel because there's multiple different architectures mm. around, right? So if you think about it, there's one side of saying, hey, if we can prevent that, so taking in a huge amount of data, having it talk, having a life cycle around it, and literally being able to detect and then prevent fraud before the fraudsters can actually figure out what to do, that's fantastic. And then on the plus side, you could take that same pipeline and that same application, and you can actually provide it to the retailers and say, well, you know, what you'd want to do is things like, um, uh, I wrote, again, I wrote another blog on it, uh, loyalty brand. You know, on the retail side is, I mean, for instance, um, my wife, uh, we shop like crazy, everybody does. I try not to. Um, but let's say, I'm, let's say she's been on a Nordstrom site and we've, and we've got a Nordstrom. So Nordstrom has a cookie on a system and they can figure out what we've been done. And she's, she's surfing around and, you know, she finds a dress she kind of likes, but she doesn't buy it because she doesn't want to spend the money. Now I'm in Nordstrom's about four weeks later and I've literally, you know, buying a pair of socks, quite a card swipe. And what it does is because you've got this omni-channel and you can connect the two, what they want to do is to be able to turn around and say, well, oh, Guy, before we run this credit card, we noticed that your wife was looking at this dress. We know her birthday's coming up. Right? And by the way, we've checked our store and we've got the color and the size she wants in. And if you want, we'll put it on the credit card. Well, so they can do she'll, cross. creep her out too much. She won't want you to get that dress. Well, actually. No, it's, it's, a great, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting example, right? But, but, it, but it is that. And if you kind of think about it, right, it it's, right. and this is where, you know, when they say every second counts, it's like every millisecond counts. Right, right. And so it really is machine to machine real time. And that's what we're providing. Well, that's the interesting thing. So, you know, a couple things just jump into mind as you're, as you're, as you're talking. One is by going the application route, Right, you're reducing the overhead for just pure talent that we keep hearing about. It's such a shortage in some of these big data applications, Hadoop specifically. So now you're delivering a bunch of that that's already packaged to a degree in an application. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I kind of look at the engineering talent inside organizations like a triangle, you know, and at the very top you have uh, talented engineers that basically can hard code. And that's really where our technology has sat traditionally. So we go to a large organization, they have 100 people dedicated to this um, sport. Um, the challenge is then it means that small organizations don't have it, can't right. take advantage. Right. And then you've got at the, at the base end, you have technologies like Tableau, you know, as a GUI that you can use by an IT guy. And in the middle, you've got this massive swath 
of engineering talent that literally isn't the you know Yoda hard code on the analytics stuff and really can't do the Hadoop cluster right. but they want to basically get dangerous on this technology and if you can take your you know the the top talent and you bring that into that center and then provide it at a cost economics that makes sense then you're away and right. that and that's really what we've seen is so our client base is going to go from the fortune 10 fortune 20 fortune 50s into the fortune thousands and you bring it down and that's really if you think about it that's where splunk kind of got their roots right, right? which right. is really get an application allow people to use it, execute against it, and then build that base up. That's ironic that you bring, bring up Splunk, because George Gilbert, one of our Wikibon analysts, loves to say that Splunk is the best implementation of Hadoop that was ever created. <laughs> he thinks of it really as a Hadoop uh, application as opposed to Splunk, because um, they're so, super successful, they found a great application, they've been doing a terrific job. But the other piece that you brought up that, that triggered my mind was really the machine to machine. Mm. And real time is always an interesting topic. What is real time? I was like, real time, means in time to do something about it. And that could be a wide spectrum depending on, on what you're actually doing. And the machine to machine aspect is really important because they do operate at a completely different uh, level of speed. And time is very different for a machine to machine operation, interaction, interface than trying to provide some insight to a human so they can start to make it make a decision. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, it was again one of those moments through the last 5 months I was looking at it. There's a very popular technology in our space called Spark, uh, Apache yeah, Spark. Yeah. Um, and it's successful and it's great in batch and it's got micro batch and there's actually a thing called Spark Streaming which is micro batch. But in essence, it's about a, a, a second latency. And so you look at it and you go, but what's in a second? You, you know what I mean? I mean, right. surely that's good enough. Right. And absolutely, it's good enough for some stuff. Right. But if you were, I mean, we, we, we joke about it with things like autonomous cars. Right. If you have a cruise control, it's an adaptive cruise control, you don't want them run on batch because that second is the difference between you slamming into a truck or not. Right. You know, if you have DHL that are doing delivery drops to you and you're actually measuring weather patterns against it and correlating where you're going to drive and how and how and where, there's no way that you're going to run on a batch process. And then batch is just so slow in comparison. Uh, we actually built an application and it's a demo up on our web um, and it's a, a live app. And what I sat down with the engineering team and as I said, oh, look, I need to, I need people to understand what real, real time does and the benefits of it. And it's simply doing is shifting the analytics and actions from the right hand side of where the data store is to the left hand side. So you take all of the latency of park the data and then go find the data. And, and what we did is we said, look, what, what I want to do this really fair. And um, when you're a kid, there used to be games like Snap, you know, with the cards right, that you turn right. over and you go Snap and it's mine. Right, right. So you just look at it and say, okay, why don't we do something like that? It's like, like fishing, you know, tickling fish. And who sees the first fish? You grab it, it's yours. So we created an application that basically creates random numbers at a very, very huge speed. And whichever process, we have three processes running, which everyone sees it the first time, puts their hands up and says, I got that. And if somebody else says, I've got that, but they see a timestamp on the other one, they can't claim it. And one wins and, and the other two lose. And I did it and we optimized around um, basically the Apache Apex code, which is ours, uh, in stream mode. The Apache Apex, believe it or not, in a micro batch mode and Spark streaming um, as fast as it can. And we literally engineered the hell out of them to get them as fast as possible. And if you look at the results, it literally is win every time for stream and a loss every time for the other two. So from a speed perspective, now the reality is, like I said, is if I'm showing a dashboard to you, right, right. by the time you blinked, all three have got you the data. Right. So it's immaterial. You know, and, and this isn't knocking on Spark. Um, our largest deployments all run on what we call like a, a cask type um, architecture, which is basically, you know, um, Kafka, Apache, um, Spark. You know, so, so we see this in Hadoop right. is always in there. So it's kind of this cache thing. Um, so we like it for what it is, but, but where customers come unbundled is where they try and force fit a technology into the wrong space. Right, right. And so again, you mentioned Splunk, you know, the, these sort of waves of innovation, you know, we find every client sitting there going, I want to get insight quicker. You know, the amount of meetings that we're all in where you right. sit there and go, if I'd only known that now, right or before, then I would have made a decision. And, you know, in the good old days, we worked at At Rest Data. At Rest was really the kingdom of Splunk. You know, and then if you think about it, we're now in the tail end of Batch, which is really where Spark's done. So Splunk and Spark are kind of right. there. And now you're into this real time. So, so again, it's, it's running at the fair pace, but, but the, I think the learnings that we've had over the last few months 
is um, toolkits are great and platforms are great, but to bring this out into a mass adoption, you really need to make sure that you provided hardened applications. So we see ourselves now as, you know, real-time big data applications company, not, you know, just uh, right. Apache. And when you look at the application space that you're going to attack, do you look at it kind of vertically? Do you look at it functionally? Kind of, you mentioned fraud is, is one of the earlier ones. How are you kind of organizing yourself around the application space? Yeah, I, and so I, I kind of, the best way for me to describe it, and I, I want to spin it in a better way than this, but I'll tell you exactly as we've done it, which is I've looked at what the customers have currently got, and we have deployments in about um, a dozen big customers, and they're all different use cases. And then I've looked at it and said, what you really want to do is you want to, you want to go to a market that people have a current problem, right. and also in a vertical where they're prepared to pay for something, yes. and solving a problem that if they give you money, they either make money quickly or they save money quickly. Right. So, so it's actually, so simple, it? I, and it, but, but it would be much better if I said in a pure way and I made some magical right, thing up. Right, but in right, reality, right. as I'm looking and going, you, you got to go where the hottest problems are. And right now, if you think of things like card not present, you look at roaming abuse, you know, um, and you look at omni-channel from payment fraud, everybody is looking for something. Now, the challenge is the, no, the market's noisy there. Right. And so what happens is everybody's saying, but I've got it. Well, and that's what strikes me about the fraud thing is you would think that that's a pretty sophisticated marketplace in which to compete. So you clearly have to have an advantage yeah. to even get a meeting, I would imagine. Yeah, and it's a, and, and again, we've, we've tested the market. The market's pretty hot on the back of it. We've got an application coming out shortly and we're actually doing design partnerships with a couple of big banks. So, um, so but we don't want to be seen as just a fraud. Now, we'll, we'll right. just a fraud, just a fraud prevention company. <laughs> I'll stay with a fraud myself. Um, but you kind of look and you say, look, there'll be a, a set of fraud applications because there's about half a dozen that all need to be done. Retail, uh, like I mentioned, on things like the loyalty brand stuff. Uh, we have a number of companies that are using us for ad tech. Uh, so again, I can't mention the names. Um, we actually, we've just published one, Publix. Uh, um, no, Pubmatics uh, is one of the ad tech organizations that's using our products. Um, but we'll, we'll literally come out and harden that pipeline as well. So we're just, we're, we're going to slot along, but instead of just saying, hey, we've solved absolutely everything, right, what I want right. to do is to solve a problem for someone right. and then just move forward. Right. You know, most of our customers have somewhere between three to five different applications that are running up in Hadoop in production. Um, so once the platform's in, you know, then they see the value of it. But we really want to make sure that we're, we're, we're closer to the end result and to an outcome because that's the de jure way that customers want to buy things now. Right. Well, and they always have, right? Like you said, they got a burning issue to either you got to make money or save money. Yeah. And if it's not a burning issue, it falls to the bottom of the pile because there's something that's burning that, that, that they need to fix and, and, quickly. And, 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 the, and the other thing, Jeff, is if you, you know, and again, it's, it's dirty laundry, but if you think about it, I go to an account and the account's got a fraud solution and it's all right, but it's not doing what they want. But we come along with the platform and say, hey, we can do absolutely anything. And then they go, well, I've got this really difficult problem that no one solved for me, but I'm not even sure if I've got a budget for it. Right. Let's spend two years messing around with it. And, and that's no good. Right. You know, from a small company, right. I, you really want that tractionable event. So my thing is just say, no, what we want to do is I want to go talk to John about John's problem and say, I can solve it better than the current one. And there is nothing in the market today on the payment fraud side that will provide prevention. It is all detection. Right. So, so there's a unique value. The question is whether we can get the noise out. All right. Well, we look forward to, uh, to watching the progress and we'll check in again in five months or so. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate right. it. Guy Church Ward. He's from Data Torrent, President and CEO. Took over about five months ago and uh, kind of changed the course a little bit. Exciting to watch. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you. All right, Jeff Frick, you're watching theCUBE. See you next time. Thanks for watching.